Well, good morning. I'm glad you guys made it up an hour early. Yay. For several summers when I was in high school, I worked at a canning factory, a Del Monte canning factory, and two or three summers, and they don't call them summer, they call them pea pack or corn pack or whatever pack, bean pack, whatever, they, they go by the, the, the vegetables that they're packing. And uh, then, then when I went to graduate school, I worked another couple years, a couple packs, more packs with them. And over probably my four or five years of uh, working at the, the Del Monte um, canning factory, I loved the process. And I got to see pretty much everything and how, I, I could look at the machinery all day. Uh, the, the cans are dropped off from a can manufacturer and actually one summer I even got to uh, run the forklift and unload them off the trucks. And uh, then the, the vegetables come and they're dumped in this one spot and somebody else pushes them into the hopper and then it's, it's uh, processed and, and uh, uh, usually there's an observation table and they pick out the sticks and other debris. Then there's the washing of the vegetables but things really pick up in the canning room. And all the vegetables, after it's, after it's been washed and ready to go, then it goes into big hoppers and into various sized canning machines. And then it's cooked in these big ovens. And, and uh, from there, it goes into a cooling room and then, then into the labeling room. And all this time, the, the inspectors are, are checking the grade of the, the vegetables. And, Believe it or not, it is true. They label, they switch labels immediately when the grade drops. Just so you know, those little prices do matter. And uh, then from the labeling room, then it goes into, into the, the, the warehouse, or I, I even got to load onto to trains at, uh, at times. And so my point is, there is a process to manufacturing. <clears throat> But a more difficult process is the process of human relationships with one another. And there is a process there as well. For example, when we meet our future spouses, there's something that attracts us. Perhaps, we were talking to some newlyweds recently, and sometimes there's a little unsettledness, like, ooh, I actually like this person, you know, ooh. You know, and, and there's a little, you know, like crazy love type stuff. Th then we get to know our future spouses by spending time with them and learning to trust them. You know, little by little, we open up and give ourselves incrementally to them. We learn their likes and dislikes, and eventually we get to the point where we're like, well, I might as well propose, or I, if he would say yes, I would say, if he would ask, I'd say yes. And then we spend the rest of our lives learning to really love each other and, and get to know each other. Hold that thought. We're simply going segment by segment through the book of Mark. And Mark's key verse is, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. In the first half, Jesus serves the people by doing miracles of healing and feeding, even feeding them at times. In the second half, we see the suffering servant who gives his life as a ransom. Now today, in the book of Mark, we look at the process of the disciples learning who Jesus really is. Today is the turning point in the book. When it goes from the first half to the last half, uh, the, the, the disciples, the high point of today is the disciples identify Jesus as the Messiah. But immediately then, Jesus begins to clarify what that means. Jesus prompts this uh, whole discussion of who he is by a question, who do you say I am? Now, we as the readers, several centuries later, uh, we know that the gospel opens with these words. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So we already know who Jesus is. Nevertheless, the first eight chapters, we are supposed to ask ourselves, who is Jesus? And there are three viewpoints. There's the viewpoint of the disciples, and the disciples seem very human. They're very much like us. Mark does not gloss over their imperfections. They lack faith. They don't understand. They're hard-hearted. They're not able to do what Jesus asked them to do. Then there's the Pharisees and other religious leaders. They view Jesus as empowered by demonic forces. 
at the very least, he's a threat to their religious, political power and influence over people. Then there's the common people who view Jesus as a prophet or some other miracle worker. Well, let's look at that process of how Jesus revealed himself today. When the Pharisees had When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him, testing him. They demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. When he heard this, he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why do these people keep demanding a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, I will not give this generation any such sign. So he got back into the boat and left them, and he crossed to the other side of the lake. So the Pharisees demanded a sign not to prove his divinity. They wanted to know where he gets his power from. But again, they have already concluded, earlier we've discovered, they have concluded he gets his power from the the demonic forces of Beelzebub. Now the Pharisees, they're following Deuteronomy 13, where the signs are to be tested to find out whether you really love the Lord with all your heart. So the prophet was to be tested and to find out his heart. But again, signs guaranteed the truthfulness of a, a statement or action. So let's say, let's say I, I give a prophetic word and then I work a miracle. That miracle would validate the prophetic word. Well, they, the Pharisees don't need to see any more miracles. They want proof that his source is God. But they already assume there's demonic power at work and they, they need to be convinced otherwise. Jesus is aware of their hostility. And he sighs a deep sigh of frustration because of their unbelief. If Jesus had performed a sign, they would have used Deuteronomy 13 against him. Because here's their viewpoint. Their viewpoint is, I am the judge. I stand in the religious tradition and truth. And if this guy doesn't adhere to what I think, it's got to be the other side, the demonic. And so Jesus has nothing to do with it. Not only does he leave them, he gets in a boat and goes far away. You know, Jesus, they viewed him as an outsider, and it could only be demonic power. Now, uh, here's a little teaching moment. We should be careful about seeking signs and wonders. Now, in a sense, the Pharisees were correct, because Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. So we should be very careful about running after signs or evaluating by signs. Now, we like signs and wonders. I like it when God heals people. But the Bible says the the signs and miracles will follow his people. However, we we should not seek the signs and wonders because Satan can do them too. You know, just like God can use people, the evil one can use people too. So we are to have a clear, a clear perspective on these matters. How many times have we seen Jesus already in the book of Mark, in these first eight chapters, leave a particular area? He's doing signs and wonders. He's healing many people. And he leaves the area because it's distracting from his main goal of preaching the good news and repentance to the next village. These Pharisees don't have the ability to properly judge who Jesus is. They're too prejudiced to see clearly. They're too invested in their own authority. I love it. Jesus just, he leaves, he gets in a boat because they don't see, they don't understand. Now Jesus turns his attention to the disciples. And of course, they fail again. But the disciples had forgotten to bring any food. Okay, so here they are in a boat and... um, And they're talking about bread. Oh, man, we forgot bread. And they only had one loaf of bread with them in the boat. As they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, watch out, be aware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. Herod." So Jesus is is teaching them in the boat as they're leaving the Pharisees, be aware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. And the disciples are like, oh, man, we forgot bread again. It's like totally, totally missing the point here. At this, they begin to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, Why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or even understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? 
You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? I mean, he's really giving it to them. When I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many basket leftovers were, did you pick up? Twelve, they said. And when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven. Well, don't you yet understand, he asked them. Now, not only is there the yeast of the Pharisees, there was one that went by really quick, the yeast of Herod. Just hold that thought. You see, the yeast of the Pharisees is the position that signs are needed to prove Jesus is God. The yeast of Herod is political power. These disciples are so earthly-minded, they're talking about bread when Jesus is talking to them about faith and unbelief. So let's be careful about having faith in God himself. Let's not, I, I love miracles, don't get me wrong, I believe God still does miracles, but let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's keep our eyes on the main thing, repentance and advancing the kingdom of God. The signs will follow along like our shadow, but let's not put the shadow in front. Uh, Jesus uses nine questions here to highlight the disciples' blindness. Bread, don't you know what I'm saying? You have hard hearts. They need to open their hearts through belief. Eyes that can't see. They saw all these miracles and yet they didn't understand. Now this is important for the next story. Ears that can't hear. They understand the words, but they don't comprehend. Remember the miracles. They've seen incredible miracles, the 12 baskets and the seven baskets left over. Don't you understand? Apparently not. They were the same as the crowd. They saw and heard everything, but they didn't understand the deeper meaning. Like the Pharisees, they don't have a category for someone like Jesus. They're trying to imagine him as an Elijah or a Moses, and, and they're trying to, who is this man that does, he stills the storm, he walks on water, who is this guy? And, and, for, and they have literally no reference point. You know, we learn a lot of things in life by this is like that. In fact, we learn everything by comparison, this is like that. And here, Jesus is in such a completely other category that they, they're just like lost here. The story continues, verse 22. And now the, the next story, before I read it, the next story is actually a, a word picture or a metaphor of what is happening. You see, the disciples are learning to see and understand who Jesus really is. When they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus and they begged him to touch him and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then, spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, Can you see anything now? The man looked around. Yes, he said, I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. Jesus sent him away saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. This is the third time Jesus removes someone from the crowd before he heals them. Remember, the, he, he, took the, he kicked out the professional mourners at Jairus' house. He uh, took the deaf man aside so he could communicate with him. And here, Jesus wants to build a relationship with this man. He wants to determine the level of faith. He takes him by the hand and leads him out. He wants to build a relationship with him and to get him away from the crowd. Now, this is a two-stage healing. This is the only two-stage healing in the Bible. And uh, he must have had sight when he was younger because he knew what trees looked like. Uh, this in-between stage between you know, full sight and blindness, actually affirms that this is a genuine healing. Modern stories, stories today of restored sight, often have an in-between stage as the brain and the muscles of the eyes begin to work, each other, work together and the brain decodes the impulses and the, the data it's receiving. Now, in, most of, in, in our time, most healings are a speeding up of the natural process. Occasionally there's spontaneous, uh, instant healing, but for the most part, uh, the healing takes a little time, whether it's a few minutes or a few, few weeks. And Jesus said at times that sometimes intense prayer and fasting is required for spiritual breakthroughs. 
Now, if the disciples had understood what was going on, they would have understood Jesus was the Messiah. They would have connected it with Isaiah's prophecy. Be strong, do not fear, your God will come. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue will shout for joy. When do these things happen? When God comes. Our blind man here gradually comes to sight and the disciples gradually come to understand. Their spiritual eyes are opened. Uh, now Mark has carefully compiled this story so that we can catch the impact of the statement we'll read in this next section. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. Now, I'm going to pause right there. That location is important. Caesarea Philippi is where the king, King Philip Herod, Herod Philip, it's kind of like interchangeable. Anyway, that's where he made his palace. There was a temple there to the god Pan, which means all. There was strong Roman allegiance there, and they easily shouted, Caesar is Lord! What better place for the disciples to shout, Jesus is Lord? But first, before we get to that, we've seen that, that the disciples understand Jesus is like a Moses, but he's not Moses. He casts out demons and heals many. The demons identify him, and he has authority over man-made rules, even forgiving sins. He is the great miracle worker. He has power over nature, over demons, over sickness, and even death. He's not John the Baptist, as Herod thought. He's not a second Moses, as the disciples thought, nor is he an ordinary prophet, as the people thought. And Jesus even shares the good news with non-Jews. Who is this Jesus? As they are walking along, he asked them, Who do the people say I am? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter replied, You are the Messiah. But Jesus warned him not to tell anyone about him. So Jesus is not John the Baptist, Elijah, or another prophet. And this pointed question here is important at this point in this timing of Mark, Mark's retelling of this biography. Because from here on out, everything that leads to Calvary, and he must change their idea about who the Messiah is. He must make them into strong and passionate disciples, because from here on out, discipleship is costly. Suffering and sacrifice are necessary. Peter functions as the spokesman to declare the climax of the first half. You are the Messiah! Woo. Amazing! It's been revealed. He is the Messiah. His eyes are open to see that Jesus is in a whole other category. He is the one sent by God. He is the Messiah. And Peter is 100% correct. Hallelujah! The Messiah has come. But the disciples have a lot to learn. You see, if the Messiahship meant what they thought it meant, overthrowing the Roman powers, this was the location to start, right here. This is where uh, Herod Philip had his throne. This was, the, this was the center of power at that time. Mark's very next sentence says, Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by elders, the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law, he would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. So this great revelation, this great declaration happens in the very seat of Roman power. And it's a turning point in the gospel. Jesus has to teach the disciples that from here on out, discipleship is hard. And he's not going to be a political leader. He is not going to even... The yeast of Herod, forget it. It's not even on the playing field. Now, we've seen that the disciples slowly learned who Jesus is. They are slowly getting to know him. Now, I can't help but think that when Jesus, of this, this process, when Jesus compared himself to the groom and us believers as the bride. In Mark 2, he says, 
Do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom, Jesus? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom, Jesus, is with them. Now, this is a hard concept for us men to understand, but it has nothing to do with male, female roles. It has to do with the process of getting to know our God, having a relationship with God. I want to jump to a, an illustration. When I was a pastor in, in um, Japan, my, my Japanese uh, parishioners, the single ones, would say, uh, you know, pastor, one of your jobs in Japan is to find me a spouse. I mean, like, I can barely speak the language, and you want me to pick somebody out for you? I'm like, oh, my goodness. Um, I did not do that. I refused to do that. I'm like, look, I'm an American. I could, I could really mess things up for you. <laughs> but they, they have a custom there in Japan of, uh, they call it an omiai, the honorable-looking meeting. And a matchmaker will be... Uh, um, well, usually a couple of matchmakers, because say, say it's a young man, his family will hire a matchmaker, and the, the, the ladies, they have a, their families hire matchmakers, and the matchmakers all get together. And let's say they get, get a couple of young people that are, like, in the ballpark for each other. And this, this is all pre-computer algorithms, okay? But it's still very, very common. It, almost 10% of marriages in Japan are still through an, uh, a matchmaker. And the very, the, the very first meeting is, like I said, this honorable lookover. I'm going to check this out. And they've prepared a series of questions, and, and the, the, the male and the female have looked at these questions, how am I going to answer it? And it's kind of an awkward moment because the, the matchmaker is sitting at the next table in the restaurant looking at them. How, did they, how are they responding to each other? If that, now it's a very awkward hour, maybe if things go really well, they'll, they'll put aside their notes and, and talk freely. Then if it goes really well, they'll tell their matchmaker, hey, I'd really like to take the next step, and they're allowed to maybe go out to a restaurant by themselves. They have looked each other over. Then things develop, and eventually, many like I said, 10% of marriages in Japan today are, are through a matchmaker. But there's a process of getting to know that individual. A process at any point which either side can say, no, nope, this isn't going to work. Um, and I'm wondering about what stage your relationship is with God. Are you at the just looking things over stage? Or perhaps you're at the stage you're wanting to explore more or the the point of committing your life to Jesus, or perhaps at the middle age stage of doing life together. I, I would like to, uh, if uh, Caitlin and Denise, if you could come up. I lost her name there for a minute. It just, it just walked out the door here. Um, I would like you to just take a few minutes. We're going to sing a song, but I would like you to take a few minutes and ask yourself, Am I really drawing close to God? Am I really as close to God as I want to be? When, when we adopted Annie, there was a song that was popular at that time, and it went, Jesus, draw me close, closer, Lord, to you. Let the world around me fade away. And then it repeated, Jesus, draw me close. Are we really drawing close or have we stopped growing in our relationship to Jesus? Would you stand and we're going to sing a song and if you want to just, I want you to meditate and ask, evaluate yourself. Where am I right now in my relationship with God? David said, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that my, my brothers and sisters will just evaluate where they are at in their relationship with you. In Jesus' name.